Okay, so this thing was just for fun. You should watch this later on. I tweeted it, but it's just for fun. Um, you've seen this. We're building a nice new website, and that's you know coming along. We have fast things, which is tweets, and then slow things, the blog, and then these sticky things over here. And uh, we have a Roboctopus. Like if you reload this, it's in different circumstances, which is kind of <laughs> funny. There is part of the team. Um, it has a little bio, so yeah. Kind of fun, but this will have kind of—it's a nice network problem, right? We're going to have papers, people, projects, funding, media, and they're all connected across, right? So you should be able to surf around in all of those things. So we're building a nice data. Oh, yeah, look, knitting a uh, a cardigan for an octopus is a difficult thing. There are actually cats on the wallpaper. So there's there's some there's some fun there. The robot octopus is our mascot slash evil overlord. <laughs> Everyone's scared of them. So that's there, the there, why? Yeah. Well, so actually, I just, in fact, I just threw up a little, so core team. Um, oh, no, it's not. Oh, it just died. I think Andy is messing with it. Well, we'll co it'll come back. I'll put it up. But uh, the Roboctopus is, uh, yeah, what's well interesting, distributed computation, right? Two-thirds of the neurons are out there. It's, it's biology on the inside, a little bit of robotics on the outside because we have Bongard. We have to, you know, <laughs> keep him happy. Uh, so it's for sub supermarine activity, right? Because it's a, yeah. And uh, so it's a fan of uh, complex systems in general. What else do we have? Uh, I was thinking the steak story. That freaked me out when Jeff like, told me that. Mm. Right, so it's like two of them in a tank. Oh, okay, all right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're good at, mi they're, they're brilliant things. I mean, the mimicry is incredible, and um, yeah, they're very smart, very, very smart. And they're our best aliens, basically. Like when we draw good aliens, we, they usually have tentacles. <laughs> right, we're kind of interested in the ones with you know funny eyes and stuff, but that it's really octopuses. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, no, we're, we're having making a snow octopus or something like that. There's all sorts of possibilities. All right, so the core team. So that that one looks like it, it went, uh, it fell apart. Um, that was just a little. I'll, I'll show you that some other time. Oh, this is a fun thing. I've been killing myself trying to get this to work. Uh, this is the happiness of um, Moby Dick. If you scan through the text. Let me make this work. Yeah. Right? So if you take 10,000 words and you slide that along, so it's just the first 10,000 words and then the second to the 1,000th word, and you just slide that through. Kind of a ridiculous thing to do. Uh, you see, this is this background kind of mountain peaks is how Moby Dick works out. So it goes pretty bad at the end. And these word shifts, which some of you know about, is a bit complicated, but basically they show you, like this is the last 10% versus the first 25%. It's sadder. And it's because of these words here, right? There are these negative words like evil and die and missing. And if you look at Moby Dick, you know, there are missing boats and missing people. It really falls apart. There's a bad piece in the middle. So this is kind of working out, right? So there's a ma bad piece in the middle. Uh, this little tank's here. So if you compare that to the first half, there's devil and dead and poor and corpse and murdered. And that's all, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, computational story lab. This is one of our little things. But now we have this way of embedding the, the little word shifts on top, which is fun. Okay, that's just madness. Uh, okay, we'll show you some uh, other things later on. All right, so all right, I have to open this properly. Okay, supply networks, and this is good. Okay, good, cool. All right, so lots of fun. We're gonna finish off this single source stuff, an optimality story here. We did talk about it in parks, but this is a slightly more elevated version of it with less funniness. Uh, and then we'll go to this distributed sources, which is really interesting, right? Okay. It's really distributed sources and sinks. If you think about people being distributed around a country and then things like hospitals or Starbucks or pubs, you know, these very vital parts of things that we have um, to keep us happy, McDonald's. Uh, how do you locate those given your mission, right? So it turns out that's a really old, I mean, it's an ancient problem of sorts, but it's been studied for a long time. And there are all sorts of uh, uh, ideas about it. All right, so we got into this the other day. Uh, and let me see. Right, so the idea was uh, let's consider families of shapes where they have allometric scaling, right? So they can stretch in different ways. So this, this is a case where this particular dimension grows faster than the others. Uh, and there's this general piece in here of the length scales of these shapes. Scaling is the overall volume to some power. So if we're in three dimensions and it's isometric, these would all be a third, right? Third plus a third plus a third. 
and if it's allometric, then they're slightly different, right? So we can have a quarter and three eighths and three eighths, and they have to add up to, to one. Okay, so that's an interesting thing, right? So organisms have different shapes. So if you think about how do you scale a mouse up to an elephant, obviously you have to sort of put a trunk on top. But how do you how do you do that scaling faithfully, right? Do they get thicker in some ways that you know that that are based on engineering, right? So the bones, for instance, might get thicker in certain ways for a gravity reason. We'll come to that. Okay, so very simple idea was well, if you've got a single source, right? You've got a single source or a sink. Uh, you know, the inverse is a sink. A single source, and you're trying to get to all these sinks, uh, and this is just an example from the Boston T. Then uh, just the best you could do is have a straight line, right, servicing all of them, and you can bundle those together, right. So that's you know this is the real network, and it's 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 not far from that. All right. So I added this picture just to hopefully clarify things a little bit. One thing we add here now is that you, these vessels can, might be able to uh, fan out, for example. So if you imagine blood flowing through here, at the, this is the aorta, then slow out here, right? Spreading out, slow out here. So that's one way to just geometrically encode a speed change, right? Because we're not actually going to flow anything through here. Uh, and the only way for this, this, this shape change to really affect the overall scaling, if you think about it, so this could grow linearly, for example. That won't affect the overall scaling that we're going to get to. We're going to think about. So our question is, how does the volume of the network and the vo and the number of sinks that you can service most optimally uh, scale with the overall volume of the of the shape? Right. So let me let me just say that again. Right. So this is our question. What's the highest alpha, if you like, if it's a scaling problem that the number of sinks can scale with volume? How many things can you pack in? Well, it's capillaries. Maybe it's people. You know, very roughly for cities. What's the best you can do? Okay. Um, so this is a way of encoding that slowing down, which we talked about with Murray's law. That seems to be exactly what's happening at the outer uh, reaches of our own networks. Uh, all right. So it depends on... So, so here's the observation. If this radius uh, scales as... And this is L here going this way. as some So it's scaling, right? There's an epsilon here. It's, it's decaying. Now, that's the only way you'll affect the overall volume of the network. As I said, linear is not going to change anything. It has to have some sharp changing. OK, so it's greater than or equal to 0. It's decaying like that. You can imagine this is a, you're right, this, right, it's a inverse polynomial thing. Uh, and if you compute the volume, right, so this is a nice little um, calculus problem, right? little integral problem. You have to add up all these little disks, and their radii are getting smaller. Very delicious kind of problem. Always fun, right? It's going to be two pi. It's going to be pi r squared, right? For that bit, yep. And then there's a, the way that r is changing with l, and the little d dl gives you the thickness of all these little chunks. Okay, you can do that. Um, and I'm going to sort of speed through this. So you'll get um, two results. One is that the, this volume of this guy will scale as l to the one minus two epsilon, right? So it's decaying, right? So the higher eps if epsilon is zero, which just means there's no, sh it's just a tube then the volume just scales as length, right? Which is fine. It's just a tube. just depends how long it is. If it's epsilon is greater than zero, then it's decaying, right? We're losing that shape. Uh, and in fact, if epsilon is greater than a half, so it's, it's really, really bunching in very quickly, then uh, this actually approaches one. So this is just all the, all the volume will be in this bit. And as soon as you get away from it some distance, you're not adding any more to it. It's, so it's decaying so fast, right? So there's just this outside fan. Uh, so that gives you a couple of results you can deal with later on. But this is, um, right, this is the main uh, observation that the best networks we could have would be broken down into these kind of star type structures. And the best, uh, so the, the minimum network, right, we want to minimize the, the network that we have because you're thinking about blood or whatever it is, you know, um, you know rivers don't necessarily minimize anything, but uh, that's, you know, it's an idea. Uh, but it seems plausible for biology. All right, so we have some density of stuff. So rho dx is the amount of the number of guys in a little box dx. And then this is this this is how much volume is associated with the tube that is going from the source to that sink. So this is the distance from the source, right? So there's a heart at, at the origin, and this one minus two epsilon is this thing we computed for zero epsilon uh, epsilon between zero and a half. So that's a little problem to um, address. Okay, uh, it's just some, 
So the funny thing is you do this for arbitrary shapes, which is kind of cool, right? And they're allometric growing shapes, and that's all you know, and you just know their scalings, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. You just know how this shape is deforming as you go up through sizes. Uh, this notation means there's a particular shape. It is a, a d-dimensional shape, so it could be two-dimensional, living in, say, big D, which is perhaps three-dimensional, right? So it could be a surface in three dimensions. And it has a volume, a typical volume V. And that's the thing that's scaling, V. Okay. So if you uh, mess around with this and take some limits, you get this, right? So rho, that's the density of the sinks, volume to the one plus, and so a little epsilon is going to hang around in here, the maximum scaling exponent, the maximum guy. Okay. So epsilon is going to, if we increase epsilon, it's going to pull things down, which is helpful. Um, but it, so it depends on the, on the fastest scaling, All right? So it's the maximum of those uh, scaling exponents, the length, right, we had it, we had it. I want a dark pen. Okay, good, good. So is this sort of okay? Mm. No. If we're looking for a volume, we're doing three integrals that the uh, norm, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this, right, so it's going to be x1 squared, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But do we have to this power, whatever it is. It's one, minus one minus 2 epsilon, yep. Yeah. No, you've got some weird shape. Yeah, yeah. you've got a little heart in the middle, and you've got to go out to each point, and there's a little box there. And rho is, rho is uh, depends only on volume, so it could change with volume. It could get, you know, bigger organisms could have a different density of sinks, for example. So you know, you're not, you don't know what it is, and you're not going to work on that. Right? You're going to think of it very generally. You don't need to know what the shape is. It does need to be the case that um, star concave, I think it is, so that there's at least some point here, the heart, where you can get to everything, you know, straight line. I mean, we're a little bendy, but that's the idea. Right, you don't have to sneak around curves. This gamma, yeah. So that's so you have. Uh, okay, the best. Yeah. Uh, so here's this shape, and it's got a, at this for this vo it's got some volume here. It's really area. Is that okay? Okay. Stop talking. Okay. <laughs> Keep talking. Talk more. Talk less. We need a hand signal. Like, stop. Well, um, so uh, as we, so this is, so here's V and then V prime, right? So there's a bigger volume. The shape is not changing. This is the same shape. I mean, characteristic shape. But it's got some scale here, L2 and L1. We've increased the volume, and the way this shape, this family of shape changes, we get to some new length scale here and some new length scale here. Uh, and that they individually scale with the overall volume. So L1 scales as V gamma 1, L2 scales as V gamma 2. And so if, if it's isometric and it's just an area thing like this, they'll both be a half. Yeah? Okay. But it could be, you know, like I said, 3 eighths and 3 eighths and a quarter for, for a three-dimensional thing. And then the 3 the three eighths will be the dominant one. There'll actually be two dominant. Right? And that's where we start to get the pancake um, cows. They don't grow tall, but they, yeah. <coughs> I was going to draw that. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. It's much, it's simpler for, uh, for epsilon um, greater than a half. This thing is just growing as, right, it just, it collapsed. It actually just grows as a constant. The volume of each little tube is basically a constant. So this thing just disappears. It's just one. So you're actually just integrating over the volume, so you just get rho times the volume. And it's a bit of a funny thing. That, that those net, those each vessel is just shrinking so quickly as you move away from the sink back to the source that it's basically just a thin little thread which doesn't count for anything. 
So that becomes a little dubious as to whether that can really scale, right? Because you have to fit things through these, uh, these pipes. But it's just to show you what happens if, if they do change shape. Um, all right, so if it's true that you can make them taper very, very fast in this case, then uh, the volume of the network will be just the same as uh, the overall volume, right? Um, <coughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Okay. So this is the result that you guys will find. Uh, so, and we talked about this. These are these exponents, right? So if it if it is isometric, then gamma max is one over d, right? So if it's in, yeah. Okay. So a third or half or right. Okay. So if that's the case, we just put in uh, one the one over d here. The gamma max becomes one over d. I know I, I did say this quickly the other day, but we need to warm up again. Um, if it's allometric, then we have that the, the allometric exponent, and there may be more than one of them, is greater than 1 over d. Right? So 3 eighths is greater than a third. And a quarter is less than a third. They spread apart. So we have this. And the observation is, and I guess I said this tonight, that the isometrically growing one versus the, the volume, right, the minimum volume, the minimum volume you, you could have, versus this minimum volume uh, decays, right? So there it's, it's much easier to service or supply sinks in an isometrically growing shape, family of shapes, which is important, right? So there's uh, old results that, you know, maybe these kind of funny things that we see in biology come from allometrically growing organisms, but maybe that's not true. In fact, isometric is the best. All right. Um, <coughs> yeah, okay, let me just, don't worry about that. Okay, so, um, <coughs> all right, we added this epsilon thing, but now we can say, well, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't really uh, come into play when we think about blood networks, especially if they're long enough, right? I mean, we can't have these things just going to incredibly thin tendrils and disappearing. Um, okay. Uh, so, you know, there's a limit to how, are right, you sending these packages through and if it's, you know, blood cells and so on, there's, there's a limit to how small these tubes can be. So, you know, there was some nice math, but then we have to uh, be reasonable. Okay, so um, <coughs> we'll look at two things, blood networks. So we're going to say epsilon is about zero for these things. So uh, it costs, you know, it costs a lot to have blood, right? So we're going to say that this minimum volume uh, network is, is, you know, roughly going to be uh, achieved by organisms, so uh, the epsilon drops out. We have rho v to the d plus one over d. Let's go back to that guy. Yep. Sorry. Right. So this is the best version of it. So if epsilon is uh, zero, it's one plus one over d. Okay. So we can make it d plus one over d. Good. Right. D plus one over d. It's one plus one over d. So it's good. So if rho was just a constant, then you have this weird problem, right? The minimum network volume is actually scaling as volume to the 1 plus 1 over d. It's actually growing a bit faster than volume. That is bad. Mm. And we had that in pox. That is bad because eventually your blood doesn't fit in your organism, right? And you have to have separate containers. <coughs> okay. And there was a paper in PNAS years ago that flat out said that. Uh, and then the next paper said, well, maybe that doesn't work. Um, so you can, com well, we've talked about this, you can compute, some of you have seen this, you can compute, say, if a mouse, 10% of a mouse's blood is, uh, body is blood, which is not a bad estimate, uh, then, you know, you scale up to an elephant, then you have something like a thousandfold. Uh, the, the elephant has 1,000 times its body size in blood. So that's not good. All right, so that's, that's pretty obvious that, uh, that we're going to have to address that. That's what that's going to mean is rho has to change. Right? If this is scaling faster than volume over here, it's V to the 1 plus 1 over D, the best we can do is uh, the density has to go down. So cardiovascular networks, they, are, they live in D dimensions, or they are filling a D dimensional space, a little d, little d equals 3 dimensional space, and it's inside a big D equals 3 space. All right. Uh, this is well known. People have checked this with organisms that the volume of the network actually does scale with 
right? That thing I said before about mice and elephants doesn't work. It really is a, you know, it doesn't vary much with volume. Okay, so if this is true, volume of network is scaling with V, and we have this structure here, right? It's one plus one over D, then this guy has to be going down. It has to get rid of that one over D. So that's what this is. Rho is proportional to V to the minus one over D. So the density of, so you, your elephant has, the, the capillaries are further apart, is, is the rough story. Right? And, it's in a, and there's a scaling for how that works. Uh, and it's D, this is one third. So you can you know, check to see how this works, right? So the, um, yeah, so given you know, certain constraints and the kinds of networks you can have and the way you're moving things around, the kinds of tubes, uh, the, 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 the best you can do, right? The best you can do. And you've, you've limited by the fact you've got this heart sitting in the middle of a three-dimensional space. It's a tricky, you know, you're trying to send it out two, three dimensions, but you're in a zero-dimensional, zero if you like, source. Uh, this, is, this is the constraint. All right. Um, we can connect this to this very famous and very controversial um, law in law in biology. And it's the uh, rate at which organisms use energy, right? So this is a very this is, you know, big deal, right? So you have so many organisms of a certain size and they use energy in a certain way. You have less big ones than little ones, so you have ecologies and you have to think about that. You have to think about us, how much we use in different kinds of states. Uh, but very simply, you could say, well, um, the uh, overall rate at which energy is being used, well, it's going to be proportional to these capillaries at best, right? So the, that's a density, so we multiply these to get the total number of capillaries. Volume is roughly proportional to mass. Uh, so we had a rho was proportional to um, V to the minus 1 over D. So if we put these things together, we get D minus 1 over D, right? Yes, so when d equals 3, it's 2 thirds. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is controversial because people love 3 quarters here, and we've talked about it. Some of you have seen this. There's a belief that this is 3 quarters. I call it quarterology. It's total madness, um, and it comes out of a, a long history of people making things up. That's, you know, <laughs> and that's probably all I'm going to say here. This is a much more efficient sort of production. Um, but it really is weird. But this is, of course, you know, a particular calculation uh, you know, we're talking about geometry. Maybe there are funny other things that biology has produced and so on. On the other hand, three quarters is, this is supposed to be the resting metabolism, right? This is just like keeping it together, staying alive. Um, three quarters, of course, is a difference of just one twelfth, which isn't much. But, you know, if you're talking about how this might relate to drug doses and all sorts of things, then it becomes, like toxicity, it becomes a big deal. Apart from the fact it's basic science and understanding, you know, things. Uh, but this is... This is a s this two thirds is it's not as steep as three quarters. So this is a better situation. Right? Organisms are doing biology has found a better kind of ground state basically. Right? Three quarters suggests an inefficiency. I've never ever talked about. <laughs> uh, three quarters sounds magical because this is kind of a boring result, um, <coughs> and I'll I, I'll say why that's boring. So okay, there might be there might be some other things going on. Uh, so this is a really nice result though. So if you think about um, so you've got these shapes. So imagine you've got these three-dimensional shapes. So let's imagine our organism is a parallelopiped. <laughs> All right, so we have, um, oh, we're in Minecraft. Yeah, OK, that makes sense. All right, so it's got some eyeballs on the front. Um, yeah. So um, OK, pig. OK. Uh, zombie pig, I think these are called. OK, so this guy is going to be scaled up in some way. You know, maybe it's getting long and thin, right? It's, got, it's still got a nice snout. Um, but it's a zombie. Uh, I believe there are zombie pigs. Minecraft fans? No 11-year-olds out there? Okay. So, um, okay, so this, uh, this guy is, this character here is, is scaling up. Maybe he's getting longer and thinner. So how's the surface area scaling? That's kind of an interesting question, right? How's that scaling? So if it was isometric, then surface area would be scaling like volume to the two-thirds. Okay. Fine. But it's actually not true when that ac th actually gets changed, all right? This gets changed. So that's a good problem to think about. It turns out that, um, and you're giving off heat through your surface. So this is why it matters, right? So if, if things are isometric, you do get this. And so your surface area, which might be proportional to your average energy usage, because it kind of has, has to balance out, uh, works, right? It's, it's going to be proportional. This is proportional to surface area. 
right? You can invoke black body radiation and do some estimates and you actually get kind of a reasonable number. Uh, but you get a different scaling if, it's if these organisms are growing allometrically. And uh, <coughs> you, you get a different scaling and you see they don't match, okay? You'll see that they won't match. All right, but that's a little task for you guys to, to work on. All right, I'm gonna zip through some of this. Uh, just some general things that we know about. It's very confusing, and I've said this is a controversial thing, and I've talked about it to some of you. So alpha is two thirds is really fantastic for all birds. You know, these big data sets of all birds, and birds go up to about 100 kilograms for an ostrich, and tiny, just a few grams for the smallest ones. Really solid. Uh, for mammals, the best data sets I've seen, this is, I guess, some years ago, uh, really good for the little guys up to about 30 kilograms. And that's a, a lot of organisms, rats and mice and gophers. Um, shrews are the smallest mammals. They can be three or four or five grams. They're really tiny little mammals, little bits of fur, basically. Um, up to, of course, uh, elephants. But uh, there's a break in scaling. Like, uh, but maybe, maybe there's not really a break in scaling. But it's just that, you know, the it's hard to measure this. You have to somehow measure the basic you know, metabolic rate of an elephant. Like, just sit in a chair and watch the TV, and we're going to measure how much, uh, you know, energy you're consuming. <laughs> Put the Red Bull down, you know. Like, okay. That's hard to measure, and, and some of these measurements are very old. Um, <coughs> okay, so maybe, maybe we have a different scaling regime. There's a nice uh, result from years ago. Economists showed that there was a, a break in scaling in the way limb lengths, uh, right? So little guys are kind of isometric, and then once you get up to a bigger scales, they seem to change because gravity becomes a real problem in structuring organisms, right? There's buckling problems and so on. Uh, Many, many other results, and this has happened in the last 10, 15 years. So this is a paper by White and Seymour. They threw away all these large herbivores. They just took them out of the data set and got this scaling relation. Um, so then this is more. So now they're saying it doesn't support a universal um, thing, that there isn't one. Van Savage, who was a, you know, initially pro all of this, uh, kind of has, no, that's actually PLOS, and has another paper later on in Nature saying, well, it's, you know, there's nothing universal. Uh, everyone's confused. And then, you know, and then we have people coming in and saying, no, it is quarter powers. Blah, 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 right? That's actually based on my work. But, you know, I said it was two-thirds, and they're going, no, well, you add this bit, now it's three-quarters. So it's just insane. Okay. Right. Right. Anyway, but, you know, you could imagine generalizing this to cities and so on. Like, you know, it's a different thing that you have pulsing of stuff going in and out. That's a different kind of thing. Like, how big can these things be? B and how efficient can they be? Um, all right, more work. Uh, so river networks. So this is a nice little story. Um, okay, so it's going to be uh, a bit easier. So now we're it, D is a two, right? It's a two-dimensional thing. So we're going to use the same result. Uh, we have uh, three halves actually. So the volume of the network is now scaling as um, V to the three halves. And density here, we can't play with density. We can't say the sort of density goes down with a bigger surface. We just sort of think, well, this is kind of very, very roughly, there's rain falling in some, on average, over time in lots of different areas. Obviously, a very big desert areas and so on. But uh, you don't get to kind of play with this. Uh, so let's say it's roughly constant, especially through time. So we can't decrease it. We can't get rid of that half, right? So in three dimensions, there was this plus a third. And we got rid of it by making density go, go down. Can't do it here. So this is growing. And so this is a bit of a problem, right? So network volume is now growing faster than the volume, the sort of the volume of the basin, which is actually its area. So it's a little bit scary. Uh, but it's fine, because these are two-dimensional surfaces living in three dimensions. So they can, right, rivers get deeper. But with us, you can't do that. You can't, there's no way to, yeah, yeah you can't uh, expand into some other fourth dimension. There are literally our papers, the fourth dimension of biology. There are several of these. Mm. One in science, which no one ever talks about anymore. The people behind it don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, because it's very big. It's like, well, let's just add another fourth, you know, sort of time. I don't know. Ah, okay, so streams can grow in depth, right? Okay, so this, this, is, this is fine. Okay. Um, all right, so that's, that's sort of a quick... Uh, piece there. I mean, it has to be put into this larger uh, story about optimality for networks. But it was one source to many sinks, or many uh, sources coming to one sink. 
right? Think about those in different dimensions. Right? We've dealt with the d dimensional problem. Now we're going to, things are all going to live in the same dimension, but it's going to be a different game. This is a lot of fun. So um, I know you're ha already having fun, but um, this will be more fun. Okay. All right, so it's going to be two dimensional. You know, when we think about humans, we are running around in two dimensions, basically. We can jump a little bit, but not much, right? If you put a human on a continent and make them jump, they don't really get very high. So uh, we are spread pretty thinly. Um, and we get in planes now and then, and sometimes we do really crazy things and jump out of things. But we're really basically stuck in 2D. We build some buildings. You know, that, that does help. That has an effect. But we'll think about two dimensions. All right, so uh, now we're going to have sources and sinks all distributed together. Right, so we just had a heart and sinks, and now we have sources and sinks all over the place. And we'll think about how to connect them together. Right, so you may have, so you've got your, um, let's say you've got your your uh, post offices. Right, so they locally go out to the sinks and sinks and sources. Right, people's places, and then they bring things back. And then there's a big network connecting all of that together. Right, and FedEx. I mean, the post offices have solved various problems over time, but you know, FedEx and UPS have come along. Amazon actually has been a big uh, contributor to figuring out how to send things around. I mean, they put, they do all sorts of stuff, like put everything together in one big box, everything that goes to a postcode and kind of essentially interface with the UPS or whoever it is, or the mail. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, optimizing how to, s how to send stuff around. Uh, building places in Cincinnati, right, or Ohio, because that's kind of in the middle, right? So right, okay. So we'll see that later on. Yeah, what's the middle of, because uh, there's, there's, the, there's the, say, the 48 states, but then there's where people live. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get that Memphis. Yep. Yeah, they have different places. I think Memphis might be a big center for FedEx. All right. I'm talking, I don't know. Um, <coughs> you know, a huge hub. Everything comes in. And kind of massive things with, you know, rolling floors and all sorts of stuff that, d you know, repackage them. Okay. So uh, the problem is going to be that, of course, we have uh, non-uniform densities of, of these humans that we're interested in. Um, <coughs> of course, for the greater good, we study the humans. OK, so no, for people, right? So we're, we're for various reasons, geography, you know, all sorts of history, we are you know, where, where the, the nice uh, skiing is. You know, we're, we're in strange, we're distributed in strange ways. Um, so. Clearly, right, if you have your sources, um, your sinks all over, uh, distributed at least randomly, but basically uniformly, then you'll have to put your um, sources on that same way, right? So you might want to think about that, actually, because you, you now you have a lot of, you have a lot of, uh, right, lots of people. Okay, I'm just going to cover the board with dots. But now you're going to have, uh, occasionally you're going to have a, a, right, a little, each, Many people are serviced by one, you know, little institution, right? So they don't, you don't put them down randomly. So where do you put these guys? How are they laid out? So that's a nice problem to think about, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, we'll think, we can think about this. I'm just going to tell you right now, but we'll come back to it. Um, hexagonal lots, that's good. So that's a nice, so it's a 2D problem. 3D, it's harder, it's messier. 3D packing is nasty. 2D packing, we've sorted out. Um, so, <coughs> and I think uh, some Japanese stuff where they're growing pumpkins so they fit at least in squares, but you could also, you just put them in a box, right, and make them grow so they come out as a square. They pack better. But you could make them grow hexagonally as well. Okay, yeah. <coughs> All right, okay, so that's good. And we love this, this is a great lattice. Fantastic lattice, right? We talked about this in Pax. There's this beautiful universal feature, which is that if you have a great big hexagonal lattice and you squish it a little bit and try to strain it and so on, do all these sorts of things to it, you can't tell that it has a lattice inside it. So if it has a, if it's a square lattice, you can feel that lattice, right? It would be stuck this way and stuck this way. You couldn't compress it, but you can shear it. And you, could, you could feel the microstructure. But the hexagonal lattice is the only one where you can't do that. You can't feel that. In 3D, there isn't one. 4D, there is one. So, uh, lots of madness. Um, anyway, it's a cool lattice. Okay, so we're going to uh, travel through uh, a, a number of um, pieces of work. So, there's Stefan, 1977. Um, 
really interesting. This was published in Science, I believe this one was. Let me get it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Why can't I see my mouse? Hello, mouse. Why would you, sir? Can anyone see my mouse? No? It's in the corner. It's hiding. Oh, I got you. All right. Yep. E so 77 was in science. Yeah, All right. There you go. It's cool. Um, it's a sociologist. Okay, right. And so we've got geographers, pure mathematicians, lots of different people thinking about this problem. Um, <coughs> and, and, and even this really recent work by uh, Ahmed Al Korean work. Um, on the US and C South Korea, really interesting. So that adds a really nice piece at the end. Okay, <coughs> right, so we're gonna have this uneven population. And we need to, we wanna build these end facilities, we have to maintain them, so that's gonna be a thing to measure every time we have to op you know, put into our optimization. Um, and here's one constraint. So this is, this is a very important one, we're gonna carry it for a long time. But you might think of different things to minimize or optimize, right? So uh, this is a very pro-social thing to do. So you want to minimize the average distance that everyone has to travel to your fine establishment, which, say, might be a, a public school, right? Um, and you have different motivations if you're just trying to extract money from the, the, the humans out there with your whatever it is, Starbucks or something. Uh, you have different behaviors. Okay. So that's the thing. We're going to try and try to do this, right? So we've got some uneven population, and then we want to put down these n little blocks. So imagine you've got this big distributed, the points in space, and then you want to put these things down, such that the average distance. So what's going to start happening is, as soon as you put them down, um, you build, right? So there's a boundary there, there's a boundary there, um, and there's a boundary there, right? So you start, that's not right, but you'll get this sort of thing. So you start to get Voronoi diagrams popping out. So everyone, these, these characters all travel to here, right? And these ones will all go to this way. So if you're right on the border, you have to, you know, you go this way. You, yep. So you get Voronoi cells. Familiar with these things? Voronoi. Voronoi. Okay. Really? <laughs> yeah, so it's a classic, uh, let's see, Varnoy, you know, some famous Russian character here. Uh, yeah, so you have points, and then it's the, uh, the each cell around a point um, is constructed such that all points in that cell, are that the closest, the closest, okay. Imagine these are the facilities, and then it, there are all these people distributed uniformly here then uh, all the people in this cell, this is their closest facility. It's one way to think of it. So these are called Voronoi diagrams. And you see them in lots of different settings, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, wow, there's all sorts of, it's, uh, okay, yeah, there you go. I mean, people play around with them a long time ago, 1644. Uh, this is, of course, it's Descartes, because he wrote things down. But actually, yeah, 100 years ago. So it's very practical to start with, right? Geophysics. Uh, my mouse is traveling. Um, interesting. But all sorts of um, settings where this is a useful thing to think about. OK, so this is Gassner and Mark Newman. So Mark Newman is a very famous guy in complex networks, uh, physicist at um, uh, Michigan. And uh, this was a nice, there's a, a small body of work that they produced on this kind of problem, right? And if you dig into their work, you can see that they're basing on previous, or well they've, they've managed to find previous um, similar kinds of uh, attacks. Uh, we're going to get into maps and cartograms in a really interesting way too. <coughs> okay, but that's not yet, is it? Okay, so here is, this is based on the 2000 census of where people live. Right, so it's actually so the blue is the population density for the U.S. Okay, so you know, this is of course New York and um, L.A. and so on. Right, Seattle has a good clump up there, and then 
what they've done is put these centers in. Actually, what, yeah, what you can't really, the blue, the blue dots are the centers, right? So these are the facilities. So 5,000, I think that's right. So the game was to put down 5,000 facilities such that you get this minimization. So they just simulated a kneeling thing, I think, you know, threw them down, moved them around, tweaked them a little bit. Um, <coughs> and so there'll be a few properties here that we get, uh, that we'll get to, but you, you don't see exactly a hexagonal lattice, obviously, because now it's uh, uneven. Right? But you will see something related to that. You have to do something sneaky to it. Uh, yeah, so it gets a little sparse up the top of Maine there. It really does, doesn't it? Um, yeah, well, and then of course, uh, you know, through the, the West. All right. Okay, so that's it. Yeah, that's it. And, and then you can say, okay, this is where we should put our post office. All right. Um, <coughs> so here's the interesting thing that pops out. Um, you know, obviously a very nice problem in itself, but here's, a, here's the interesting thing. So then you can look at, so you go to, um, you can go to one of these cells and you, you could compute the population density. Right? What's the density? So there's the area of a cell. Number of people, that gives you a little local uh, density. And then plot that against uh, faculty, uh, facility density. Faculty density. Okay. The density of faculty is remarkable, actually. But that's another problem. <laughs> uh, it's pretty robust. I mean, there are a lot of different you know, points, and you have to, as I said, you kind of want to coarse grain this and say count the number of facilities in a particular region um, in different ways. But it's a 0.66 is the scaling. So you have two densities, right? So as the density of the population goes up, the density of the facilities goes up as well. You, you do need more facilities, but it doesn't go up linearly. Right? It goes up as a power of two-thirds. So when you start to get think too much about physics and so on, it's like, okay, two-thirds, right? That's a two over one plus two, and two is the dimension, right? So that's what you, you hope for. Yeah? So that... that that's what you, you know, so you think, okay, I can play this game. <laughs> um, very interesting. Uh, so the fit is pretty good. R squared is 0.94. I mean, there's some, uh, there it is. So there's some messiness, but it's not bad. Uh, so two thirds, yes. Let us make it happen, right? The great tradition of lots of these, like geophysicists, you know, econometricians, whatever. It's like, you know, which number do you want it to be, right? Okay. All right, so this is known as the size density law, and uh, it's been observed, not just by these guys, but they did a beautiful job. You know, we've got good data, nice computing to uh, you know, do the simulated annealing thing. That's not, of course, that's, that's made up, right? So that's a, the population is real, but then the, the facility location is made up. Okay. Um, <coughs> right, so big D is facility density, and rho is the, where the, the people are, all the marmosets, say. Whatever we have. So why is this? All right. So this is very different to branching networks. We, we, you know, we have one source, one sink. Um, things are distributed in a funny way. Right? So we have these two densities now. Before we had a density just for sinks. Now we have density for the hearts, if you like. Cool? Cool. So uh, yeah, this is work by Stefan. Uh, and he had this uh, paper, right? This is the paper. Okay. And he has a book as well. It's really just online, I think. So territorial division, the least time constraint behind the formation of subnational boundaries. So uh, it's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's zip like right? So zip had this again. This is kind of a pox thing that we talked about, but uh, um, zip had this idea that a lot of human behavior was, and we actually saw this in this talk that was given yesterday for those of you who are here. That energy minimization is sort of a thing that humans are into, right? And animals in general, but we're kind of lazy. Not terribly. I mean, we're very creative and we go and do things. But, but you know, uh, so it's this principle of minimal effort. Somehow has to be encoded. All right. Homer Simpson, okay, is uh, sort of the icon of this. All right. Uh, <coughs> could throw a Homer picture in. Okay. Cool. All right, so, uh, but it's a least time constraint. So we're going to try and create this, and, th and then we'll think about it a little bit, argue a little bit, right? It's just going to be sort of about one, you know, given a density, what sort of one little patch. It's one of these little Voronoi cells. We're just going to sort of, sort of concentrate on that. Uh, we'll come back to a more general treatment, um, which has all sorts of goodness in it. A few more Lagrange multipliers and uh, functional 
differentiation. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> um, which treats the whole thing like we're trying, you know, we'll be looking at the whole picture at once. In a, you know, again, in a rough way, but this will be sort of local to start with. Okay, so let's imagine um, we have some area, A, and it has this one functional center and this one facility inside it. So it's a bit funny, but we're going to then sort of uh, imagine, you know, this is a more dense region here, uh, this is a, a less dense one, and then this is a much less sort of dense one, perhaps. Uh, and we'll, but we'll sort of just take one block and see if we can kind of figure that out. Right. This is, again, following this treatment. So <coughs> two things you have to do with this center uh, to worry about. One is maintaining it, right? So people have to look after it. We'll see how this is encoded. Uh, I mean, I've taken the original uh, derivation and, and then I've, I've tried to make it consistent with the notation in other ways and change things maybe a little bit. But basically, it's the same idea, I think. So uh, let's say that people have some average. So they're in some area now. So they're in some box. Okay? So we'll actually, we'll, we'll say, you know, we'll coordinate off. We'll say this has got some area A. And there's a typical distance that people travel. That's an average D. And um, they have an average speed as well, V, right? It's average speed. Okay, <coughs> zombie pigs. All right. And we'll assume isometry, right? So there'll be lots of these little regions. So you imagine the, um, where there's really high density, these regions will be smaller. And where there's low density, they'll be bigger. Okay. But we're going to assume that they're roughly isometric, that they aren't growing in, like, you know, the big ones aren't weird shapes compared to the little ones. But they'll, yeah, in principle, they have to be kind of Voronoi type cells. They have to be popping out like that. Hmm. Yeah, good. good. Um, <coughs> okay, so uh, if this is, if that's roughly true, then we can say the typical distance, it doesn't really matter, they're isometric, right? So there's not one, there's not an axis to these things. The typical scale of this thing is the square root of that area, right? The typical length scale of the thing. So that's why we get this eight of a half, right? Okay, so that's going to be some estimate of the average distance that people travel. Um, <coughs> so the time expended in traveling, right? This is saying, a p this is sort of per day kind of thing. Uh, will be the typical distance divided by the typical velocity. And that typical distance we're going to say is some constant times a to the half. It's some sort of shape thing in here, right? Right. So if it was, you know, if they're all circles, which they, that doesn't fit together, if they're all circles, right, we'd have areas pi r squared. And it'd be w 1 over the square root of pi. Hurts a little bit. Right? C would be 1 over the square root of pi. I think. Okay. Yeah. And that will give us a uh, R. But we need, there's a, you know, you want your average radius. So it's not just radius. You want your average distance. There'll be some other correction. Okay. Yeah, there's something else. All right, but this is, we don't have to worry. So it's some shape factor. So if it's a hexagon, there'll be something in there as well. Mm hmm Yes, it's obvious. No, oh, okay. Okay, this is the typical distance. So we still have velocity on the bottom, which we're sort of assuming, you know, people drive cars or they, you know, run to work. No, they don't. No one does it. Um, <coughs> uh, okay, so then we have, so that's, that's the time taken to, you know, so people expending this time getting to this thing, and if it's too far, then this is like terrible. It's not good, you know, like my McDonald's is too far away. Um, <coughs> how can I live properly? So then the, your McDonald's, I'm not going to say McDonald's, then your, you know, whatever it is, your, your, <laughs> your public school, public school has to be looked after, right? Okay. No, no, because you know why would we cooperate with each other? Because we're humans. Okay, so let's say we have you know, we have to look after it, right? We have to, yeah, we're public school. We have to fix it up. So we're going to call this thing tau. This is some other, um, you know, it's some other measure of our, it's time again, but it's person hours. So, right? And this is using again the Stefan stream. There's a little bit of sneakiness here. We have to think about this. So this whole thing requires some effort to maintain. Uh, and then we'll say it's shared by people. And so the average cost in some sense, so this is taxes, evil word, taxes, um, will be sort of tau divided by P. 
but it's kind of money gets turned into time here. Money is time, all right? So it's, sh it's distributed. We had what the cost was for one person traveling. Now we have the cost per person to look after this thing. Okay. Um, and we can say population, this is where we, we want to get our densities in there. Population is, we'll write that as the area of this region times the density. Right. And we're assuming the density is not changing much within these regions. Right. So we're going to look at this one, and then we'll look at another one with a very different density, and so on. Okay, bring chocolate. <laughs> Caffeine. Is that illegal? Medicating people. All right, so, um, I mean, yes. Okay. <coughs> I really didn't drink any caffeine for a long, long time, and then I had children. So, tea people okay <coughs> okay I'm saving coffee up from when I'm like 60 I think okay <coughs> no now it's just obnoxiousness yeah um, I've never drunk coffee so that's my problem all right so the average cost per person so it's going to be this uh, time or this estimate of time that it takes to get to this uh, public school and then it's going to be this some version of some way that we put in the effort to maintain that thing Right, PTA plus taxes. Okay, so we have these numbers we can put in, right? So we have A, this is, a, right, so it's row times A, that's our population, that's sitting on the bottom. And we had a, I guess I changed G to a C to a G. Okay, okay C to a G. That's a tiny weird little thing to have done. Okay, so uh, it doesn't matter, there's an A to the half on top. Okay, goodness. So magically, we have one of these lovely little things where we have a quantity that's sitting on top on one side, and it's on the bottom, you know, it's below the other, on the other side. So we know, you know, we can differentiate this, and we'll get a, what? So if it was just, a, you know, area on top, and that you just want the smallest, things would go, wouldn't work. Okay, so this is nicely played. It <laughs> it, it's, it's like the Murray, you know, Murray's Law, this worked as well, right? We had the Poiseuil impedance, yeah? So we got the one over R4, and we had the cost for maintaining, so we had R squared over there as well. So it's terrific. So we know we can, yeah, so there'll be a sweet spot for this. So there's going to be a sweet spot for this. Of course, we have no idea what these constants are, but we can get the scaling out, right? Good physics stuff We don't worry. Like the prefactors could be anything, but <laughs> like 10 bazillion, <laughs> but, you know. That's a bit true sometimes in computer science too, right? You have the scaling of the complexity of something, like the time to run something. You know, it's polynomial, but there's a prefactor at the front, which is you know, a giant <laughs> number. <laughs> okay. And then someone just says, well, the hu here's a heuristic that does it anyway. So, you know, yeah, 98% is good. All right. <coughs> okay. So we're going to minimize with respect to A. We are just delighted to see this form appear. And, of course, no other forms were tried. This was just, you know, <laughs> this just came out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this probably, uh, yeah. This is, some of you have said this, right? This is that you have to estimate how many monks died in trying to figure something out. Yeah. And, you know, you get different people. Like Euler, for example, appeared and I don't know, he computed pi to 30 decimal places more than anyone else had done because he used one of these crazy little differences of series of signs and causes in some way. And there was literally a monk who'd spent 30 years trying to get one more decimal place. Um, I, yeah, so this is sort of like bad luck. <laughs> so there are different kinds of monks, but, um, you know, a lot of finding things out is bashing around in woods and, you know, someone finds, oh, there's a path over here, you know, <laughs> while someone falling off a cliff says, that's terrific, you know. <laughs> Don't come in here. <laughs> Uh, there's an alligator. Okay, so, um, all right, so we do it. We, we do a little partial derivative. Yay. Uh, so we have a to the half. So that's going to become a to the half on the bottom, and we get a half in the front. And uh, this guy, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And that was a uh, 1 over a, so it's 1 over a squared with a minus sign. Yeah? Good old calculus action. All right. That has to equal zero. We're just thrilled that we get to use calculus. <laughs> the fact that, you know, all of us 
these calculus classes exist, seems to actually have a point right now. So, um, okay, so uh, we rearrange this guy. Uh, you could do this. Uh, we've got a row sitting here. Yeah, so we want to get that by itself. All right, let's see. Oh my gosh. I'll rub out these guys. Okay. Yep, so we're going to put it on the other side. So let's. Um, so we have tau of a row a squared. Shove everything. Oh, it's back to C. Good. All right, C, 2. I mean, I really do try people, but sometimes things go wrong. So A to the half. So this guy is going to be over here. And we'll flip it all upside down. So there's a, this is really A to the 3 halves. And this is a row on the bottom. So row is going to be proportional to uh, A to the minus 3 halves. Yeah, all right. Well, I've done one more step than I need to. Okay, so which is the other way around here, right? A is proportional to rho to the minus two-thirds. Um, so let's do one more. So we've got this. Let's do one sneaky little thing, which is if we do one over area, just flip this, and then we flip this guy, so it's rho to the two-thirds. That's our local density of facilities because we had one facility. Aha, sneaky. You recall at the start of the book we had, right? So there was one... <laughs> It's a mystery. So there's one facility. So one divided by A is the local density of facilities. So this is our big D. Okay, I tried to redo it so there was a big D, but there's not a big D. Yeah, so we get to D is proportional to rho to the two-thirds. So this little argument, yeah. Yeah, there's some, I mean, there's a power of a half there. So that's, there's, there's our one over little D, or one over the D, the dimension, right? That's one over two because it's the, right, if it was a, if we're in four dimensions, then it would be a quarter, right? Because it's the typical length scale of that shape. So it's the volume. Yeah. Yeah? So wait, this is a space or negative one? Yeah, D is, well, you know, locally, this is D. Because it's one number of facilities divided by the area. So just for this little box. And then we look at different boxes with different densities, and, and this will move around. Yeah. No? Yes or no? Which D? That's true. There have been a few Ds, haven't there? It's the big one with the big space with the Okay. Yeah. Big D. Yeah, that was this, um, I think I can... Needs a, it needs a, it needs a, all right. I'll <laughs> you know, I could just make it row facilities and row humans. Okay. That would be better. Yeah. Row is an excellent density. Okay. Yeah, now row is just yeah. very, it's very. Differential equations, that's where your mind is going. Anyway. It's clearly divine, d yeah, and big, d yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. But still. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty sweet. But we did some kind of funny things, I think. So the, this maintenance is independent of the population, which is a bit, right? So this public school, so this public school, right, requires a, this, this tau, this number of person hours, independent of the size of the community. So you're, I mean, you maybe you can get to this argument in a different way. You can just say that the cost per person is you know some fixed number divided you know you might want a different I don't know what that is but maybe we can have a different argument that gets you there. Uh, that's a bit tricky, I think. I mean it works, but. so maybe that just needs a better argument. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do we need to worry about the maintenance of those nodes? It's the maintenance of the facility. Well, you have to keep the school running. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, if you keep the school running. Yeah, but that's what it is. Now, this is what tau is. It, and it's divided by the population, which we can write as, which is a big P, and we wrote as density times area. I guess. Okay. So, 
you know, really what's happening is this, this is, this is sort of okay, and then this is somehow you need to get it. But you need to very specifically have 1 over a here, right? You can imagine it being 1 over a squared or 1 over, you know, like there's some sharing going on, but it has to be 1 over a. Okay. <coughs> well, that's, so that, that's something to think about. Just you guys think about it and tell me what's the, the right thing. So, okay, this will be a great place to stop. I just want to show you this. So, uh, this fellow has an online uh, book, which I really recommend you um, look at. So, let me show you a little bit of it. Um, read me first. So, this is actually written in 1995, and it was built on a number of years. So, it started in, well, doctoral dissertation was 68. Uh, so it's it's really interesting to read, right? So he talks about moving it from you know eight inch floppies, uh, having to rewrite it all onto another computer, right, and using BASIC and all this. This is this is you know back. You can't believe this sort of stuff. And so right, so a year ago I started to play on the net, 1994, right? The web, the web appears, <laughs> crazy, right? So it's just there. And for which I was recently berated by my colleagues in an annual evaluation. So this is a sociologist getting it from. I mean, why would you think think what people do on the web, you know, humans? Um, the field was soaring in what, I, what, it, what it called theory, ideology, so far as I can tell, with no empirical foundation or referent, and diving into what it called methodology, misapplications of complicated statistical procedures to highly questionable data. Very similar to what's going on now. This is why this is great. <laughs> Very similar. Um, I mean, nothing strange. At the same time, I got a Mac <laughs> with its increased graphic capabilities. This is 1995. Um, I couldn't refrain from producing another one, so we did that. Uh, but it's a, it's a really, um, let, let, me, let me get his book. There's a, the thing I, I think you should, oops. Chapter zero. Wow, that's so, so annoying. Sorry, he moved it away from here. Maybe here? Yeah, where is the book? Can you see the book? Yeah, where is that? Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so his finishing bit is extremely interesting. Um, this is really fun to read, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and kind of extraordinary. Maybe I can't say this simply, but talking about you know his, this is a sort of a plea to try and figure out that, that it's possible that we can figure out certain kind of laws of human behavior. Now, you know maybe you can, you can't, but um, and time minimization is a big deal, so he's excited about that. Uh, I think we should. Okay. Well, he talks about the problem of not knowing enough mathematics. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, that's fine, but, uh, I should have gotten you a little Coleman. I used to have a computer called Coleman, named after this guy. Um, just give me a second. Let's see what I can get you. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a long piece. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to tell you to read this. <laughs> There's some really, well, it is longer than I thought. Um, <coughs> but basically, this guy's railing against the sort of current problem then of, um, you know, of, of not trying to understand, uni you know, see if there are universal laws of behavior. Now, may not be the case, right? Um, uh, but this sort of there was a retreat from that, and then this idea that everything is special and describing things in different ways, you know, but um, and just never ever just being very afraid of of trying to find a, a universal picture. Okay, um, yeah, I can't summarize that for you, <laughs> for but I just I think you should read it actually. So anyway, uh, I think it's this is a lot of fun, and it's really going to grow in a different way uh, because that's really what we did today was public um, good sort of thing. We have to look at private, and then we have to look at the, so we have sources and sinks, and then we have to look at the overlay of how, how do those 
things distribute among themselves, like a, the post offices, right? So we've thought about how the post offices can be placed, but then how do they communicate? So there's that. Um, the last part will be about moving to understanding the public versus private stuff. Okay, and that will be, that will be the supply network stuff, optimal supply networks. And then uh, the next piece will be random networks, which is a very, very rich and good, fun thing. Okay? All right. Good? And we'll talk about this whole Tuesday, Thursday thing. Okay? Okay? All right. Okay, people. Awesome. <laughs>